Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. I'm welcome to the April metrics meeting for Wikimedia. I'm Rob Lanfear. And uh, we've got a, uh, a full agenda as usual here with a community update from Katie Love, um, translation update from Catherine, a, um, uh, and then a, a metrics update from, I'm trying to remember who's doing the metrics update. Um, a research update, oh, Neil was doing the metrics update, thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, a research update from uh, uh, Aaron Halfaker and a product demo from Music Animal and uh, Danny Horn is going to be uh, uh, presenting this as well. And then a Q&A session. Um, we have a few new hires, uh, not as full as uh, other months, but uh, Alex Stenson is a longtime uh, community member and he is... Uh, now working out, helping out the, the GLAM folks. Um, and uh, a couple of contractors here in the office, uh, Aubrey Johnson and Angel Lewis. Welcome. We have a much fuller slide here for the anniversaries. We have several people, uh, Stefan Moritz, Zhu, Stephen, Byron, Calliope, uh, Madhu, Neil, Joel, and uh, Michael celebrating their one-year anniversary. Congratulations. Edward, Dimitri, Danny, Sarah, Catherine, and Giuseppe celebrating their two-year. Eric, Jamie, Janet, and Jan, uh, Monty, Brandon celebrating their three-year. James and Hytham and Chris and Matthias and uh, Faden celebrating their four year. Oh, Daisy, did I miss Daisy? Oh my god, yes. Thank you. Um, and then Timo celebrating his five year anniversary. Rob Helsel celebrating his nine year anniversary, which he's going to use this slide as evidence that he's the original Rob. Don't buy it. And Tim Starling here for 10 years. Thank you, Tim, for reminding us of all of the things that we missed that are clearly spelled out in the documentation. <laughs> and now a community update from Katie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't know if you heard, but it's Bring Your Children to Work Day. So there is a lot of, there are a lot of children here, and uh, I'm sure they will give us a lot of joy and energy throughout this presentation. <laughs> okay. This is Justine. All right. So we have several things that we're celebrating and highlighting from the community and our, our various areas of work this, this past month. One big highlight for many of us, and especially the affiliates, was the Wikimedia Conference, which was held just this past weekend in Berlin, Germany, with almost 200 participants from 78 Wikimedia affiliates. This is a huge number of people, but only a third of them are actually paid staff. So most of the representatives at this conference are actually volunteers. The three cornerstones of this really important conference were how to move forward, which focused on rebuilding trust between the Wikimedia Foundation and affiliates, uh, an overarching movement theme on impact and what impact means in our movement, and then capacity building and learning, and that was sharing knowledge and experiences between our affiliates. Another cool ongoing is Wiki Loves Folk. Wiki Loves Folk is an initiative led by Wikimedia España, which is a photo contest to capture festivals declared of touristic interest in Spain and has been organized by Wikimedia España during the month of April. We have seen 560 images so far. Fabulous accomplishment. 
CEE Spring is the Central and Eastern European Writing Contest, which has happened for several years. And this is supporting article creation in every, content, every country in the region. And this is taking place right now. It uses bots and items from Wikidata to pull articles that need to be translated. Almost 30 participating languages with over 6,000 articles in two months, which is fabulous. And Casey would like to add something. Not only is it 6,000 articles in two months, the, most of the participants are already experienced editors, so they anticipate the quality will be, will be a lot higher than other writing contests we see. And the prizes, uh, $400 for each participating language, are going towards purchasing books and reference materials. So it's actually finding a pretty efficient way to get uh, things that our editors need to keep editing, do better work. Thank you. All right, the Wikimedia Hackathon also took place in April, so you can tell it's been a really big, busy month for many folks. This took place in Jerusalem in the beginning of April, and we had 118 participants from 18 countries. 40% of them were newcomers, 29% of them were women. And one of the experiments that was tried during this hackathon was the, using the community wish list and trying to see if we could use it as a goal to, to work on some of the areas in the community wish list. So eight requests there saw some progress, which is a good accomplishment for us. Wiki Arabia also took place in the month of April. Wiki Arabia is a three-day long conference for Arabic-speaking Wikimedians, which uh, actually took place in the month of March. Uh, the priority areas there were around bot programming and media wiki tools training focusing on right-to-left language issues, Wikidata, and there was some, some focus on the Wikimedia programs, focusing on learning there. There was addressing regional challenges of Jordan and Morocco, too. Important Wikimedia project milestones are Japanese Wiktionary reaching 150,000 entries, Serbian Wiktionary reaching 100,000 entries, Bengali Wikisource reaching 10,000 text units, and Ukrainian Wikisource reaching 5,000 text units. Very cool accomplishments. Congrats to everyone involved in that. WMF collaborations with communities that are upcoming. We are going to see the Community Capacity Development Surveys uh, in Brazil for Media Relations and Ukraine for Conflict, uh, conflict Management. Uh, there is also a, a Community Capacity Development work going on right now in India with the Tamil community in the next few days. And the Funds Dissemination Committee will be meeting in, in the month of May in Warsaw to review the proposals that have been submitted by four Wikimedia affiliates and the draft annual plan submitted by the Wikimedia Foundation. Please check out our, our calendar, which is the community engagement calendar, where you can see all sorts of upcoming activities. And that's it. Hello. Hello. Can you see me? Does this work? All right. I am here to give a little update on transitional priorities. As you, many of you may recall, um, at the beginning of the transition period, we identified five different transitional priorities for the organization between now and the selection of a permanent executive director. And I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of an update on where we are on those. So I'm going to actually start by handing it over to Lisa as a member of the EV Search and Steering Committee to update us on where that process is at. All right. So as you know, uh, a search a committee was formed um, as four board members, Alice, Darish, Guy, and Kelly. Um, and the, the, the board selected me to kind of represent the C team, and you selected Katie Horn to, to kind of represent the staff. Um, in April, we, uh, so the first thing that the, and really up to this point, the only action really that the committee has taken so far um, is to hire um, uh, someone to lead the search. And we've hired uh, Kathleen Yazbak from uh, Viewcrest Advisors, and she's really great. Um, I, I, she uh, went on a moment's notice to the conference in Berlin and spoke to almost everyone. Um, and really, you know, ask great questions. It really got to know us 
up um, in, a, in, a, in a pretty deep way in an amazingly fast time. And I think the next step, um, you know, I think she'll want to come here and do a similar process with you, as well as as well as people um, people who are remote. So I, I think on that front, we are we are off to a very good start, and I'm really confident in Kathleen's ability to kind of lead us through this process. So I expect that will happen, and then we'll move into uh, sort of af after we've done the research, move into writing uh, the job description. Um, and that this is kind of as far as a process as, as we have we have really defined so far. Um, and you will definitely have have the chance to give input on on the job description. But I think even before we get there, I know Kathleen wants to wants to hear from you and get input just on how to how to develop that process. So and then lastly, I'll say just in Berlin, we also held a session uh, on the ED search and got some. I mean, it was I would say my reflection was. Uh, I was amazed at how much alignment there was in the room in terms of, of what they're looking for and both, you know, there was both staff members there as well as, uh, as well as obviously community members and from the affiliate. So I think we're off to a good start and uh, look forward to, to having more staff involvement going forward. Thank you. Thank you. So the second priority was to fill critical executive vacancies and as you can see, we've done that. Um, <laughs> I want to highlight this slide because I think it's a really important one. Uh, and I also want to call it, if you haven't checked your email quite yet, many of you know that Jody is leading the HR department during the interim period, excuse me, talent and culture. Maggie's doing a phenomenal job as interim leader of the community engagement team. And I want to thank Heather Walls, who has stepped up to lead the communications department officially during this period. And the reason I love this slide so much is because if you take a look at it, it shows the incredible length of uh, service that each of these individuals has within the foundation. This is a team right now in the executive team that um, is, is really pulled from people who have been with the organization for a long time, who understand our movement and understand our mission and are doing just a phenomenal job in their interim capacities. So I just want to say thank you because we have great leadership right now um, in a way that is providing support to the whole organization. However, we do have some searches ahead of us. So Lisa spoke a little bit about the search for the permanent executive director. These are some suggested timelines that we're looking at for filling the other critical vacancies. So the CTO, the chief technology officer, is the top priority. And we've been working with the entire technology um, department to identify what that job description looks like, what that timeline and what that process looks like, and thinking about how we're going to continue to keep that in a nice open process, similar to that that we use to recruit high our CFO. Um, you can find more information about that, I believe, on uh, Meta, Meta Guy's office um, that lays out in, in greater detail sort of the process that we're looking at. The CTO, we have a job description out there. Thank, many thanks to the recruiting team that has identified a number of great candidates, and we're really moving that forward. We've agreed that the second priority after the CTO is looking at um, filling in a permanent fashion our VP of Human Resources and following that community engagement. Uh, we are, I think, really lucky insofar as we have such great leadership. And so the current feeling at the moment is that we need to make sure these are the right processes so that we get the right people in place um, rather than trying to rush this forward just in order to fill those spots because we really do have great leadership right now. But this is a little bit more detail on what we expect in terms of the timeline and process. Uh, the next priority, the third priority, was delivering the annual plan. I've spoken at length about this, so I won't get too far into it. But I think the key takeaways for the annual plan are that we're investing in our strategic programs, we're improving our core infrastructure, and we're setting the stage for long-term sustainability. This is the timeline you're all familiar with. Right now, the annual plan, I'm just going to plug it one more time, is available for comment. Please give your comments. The reason, and I, this is more of directed to those outside this room than inside this room, our community members who are watching online or are going to be watching a little bit later. This is incredibly important because your priorities and feedback um, if we integrate them now, we can adopt them so we can actually do that work in the coming year. If you don't, uh, if you're unable to share your priorities and feedback now, and we go into locking the annual plan, it's going to be more challenging for us to integrate those later on once we have sort of a clear roadmap for what we're doing. So giving us that feedback now is a great way for us to make sure that we're actually integrating some of your priorities and can execute against them in the coming year. 
How to give feedback? Great question. Here's the link. Please go to it. What are we specifically looking for? We're looking at for how we should prioritize the programs that we've put forward, what or who is missing, and where we can coordinate with you for greater impact. Um, we've heard feedback that some people are less comfortable with communicating on the uh, talk page on Wiki, so we'd also like to encourage both private comments as well. If you'd like to reach out, please, you know, uh, hopefully either where to send those comments to folks based on the leadership of the different departments where you have questions, but if all else fails, my inbox is open, please do send them to me. Um, my email address is on is online. Uh, so appreciate your feedback, public and private comments. This is some of the things that we're looking for, and that deadline uh, for close is coming up really, really soon. I believe it's April 30. So strategic plan, that was the fourth priority, is delivering that. Uh, the strategic plan is on Meta. It is our guiding direction for the next 18 to 24 months. We closed this on April 1st, along with delivering on the annual plan. The strategic priorities anchor our annual plan. As part of our sort of going over the annual plan and doing revision and revising it in, in response to community feedback, we'll be making some of those linkages clearer. That's some great feedback we got in Berlin. But what we really see the strategic plan is, is a way to give us direction for the next 18 to 24 months during the, initially this transitional period. Um, and allowing us the opportunity and space to envision the future of our movement, consider our strategic challenges, plan for greater sustainability of our community and projects, and then continue exploring some of these interesting opportunities and challenges we have ahead of us in terms of partnerships, in terms of um, evolution in technology and information, distribution, et cetera. These are the strategic priorities. I'm just going to keep repeating them at metrics meetings until you guys can all repeat them by heart. Um, but I'm not going to go into them now because I think you've heard them before. They are reach communities and knowledge. Uh, and this is, this is a little bit more detail in terms of the background on them. And then finally, rebuilding efforts across the foundation. So the way that we presented on this was that we had uh, feedback through the engagement survey back in November about some of the challenges that we were facing as an organization. And I want to speak very directly to those challenges. So number one was around, uh, the number one issue was around aggressive communications and poor conflict resolution. And number two was around not managing poor performance and poor attitude. So we've done some great work to address both of these issues, improving engagement and performance. We've reduced employee relations situations through a proactive like, mitigation of issues um, by actually stepping in when we start to see a problem and saying, okay, how can we address this and reduce the overall level of tension or try to find proactive, positive solutions that meet the needs of everybody involved. Uh, we've hired additional staff. I, I want to thank uh, Anna Stilwell. I want to thank Sarah Benson, who's probably somewhere in the room. Hi, thank you, Sarah. And I want to thank Angel for coming in, uh, Angel Lewis for coming in, who are giving additional uh, support and coaching, uh, employee relations and performance review support. It's really critical that we have these incredible people supporting this organization at this period in time. And they really allowed us to, I think, in both engage more proactively and reduce the overall level of sort of intensity in our working environment. We reintroduced one-on-one -on -one manager training for performance management, conflict resolution, and overall improved communications across the organization. And we've started into assisting with performance improvement plans if they are necessary. So people have clear understandings and expectations around what we what we expect of them as an organization so that there's less ambiguity and people are given the opportunity to continue to develop um, with, with sort of structured guidance um, in the organization. And finally, we're about to start into the um, overall performance reviews that we do on an annual basis. Uh, a major thanks to the HR team, talent and culture team, which will be doing an overall audit to identify organization-wide issue areas where we may need to provide additional support. Number two, slide number two, um, issues three and four were really around leadership. They were around um, strategy and change uh, in, the executive, uh, in the executive suite, insufficient alignment and insufficient transparency. So what we've done so far, taking these uh, actions together as an executive team and as an organization, we submitted our annual plan and our draft strategic plan so there's a lot more clarity internally and to our community as to what it is that we're doing in the coming year. We built an inter interim transition plan. Those are those priorities that I'm speaking of right now. We've increased staff consultation on critical processes, both the annual plan, the ED search committee, for example, and I really want to thank you for all of your participation in that. 
We've increased leadership transparency. Uh, you may not even notice this, but we actually are publishing the notes from our weekly C team meetings on Office Wiki um, and our retreat minutes as well. Oh, people have noticed. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so uh, by all means, please take a look. And if there are other op opportunities for us to increase transparency, please let us know. As I mentioned earlier, we filled those open positions with trusted internal interims, and we held a retreat earlier this quarter to talk about our priorities for the coming year. It's not just about addressing the challenges, it's also about building strong culture. And so I want to say um, thanks to the talent and culture team and speak a little bit to the additional measures that they've taken. We've reintroduced comprehensive 360 degree performance reviews and training on how to engage positively in performance reviews. We've reintroduced structured offboarding and exit interviews so we understand where, so we can pinpoint and identify uh, warning signs if we have challenges in our organization. We've reintroduced WikiLead leadership development training. We had a great session, I think it was two, about two weeks ago on this. Uh, we've relaunched Office Wiki for internal communications and operations update. Office Wiki looks better than it ever has. Uh, we've created new opportunities for constructive staff discussion led by Anna Stilwell. A major thanks to you for all the sessions you've been running. Uh, we've presented an all staff session on unconscious bias and launched a year long well being program to help support staff and really make sure that we're focusing on that work life balance. Um, for the coming year, we're excited to be introducing new onboarding, uh, culturation, and community orientation for staff members, clarifying our organizational values to, so that we can incorporate them in everything that we do, from hiring, reviews, promotions, and performance. And we're introducing this program in the coming year on supporting and promoting diversity so that we actually really can model the organization that we want to be, the communities that we want to have, and the impact that we want to make on the world. So that's what we're doing. It's a lot. I can't believe that this has all been done in about eight weeks time, less than a quarter. And I just really want to say thank you so much to the talent and culture team and to the entire organization for participating in this so far. So those are the five priorities in terms of the transitional update. Um, oh, excuse me, I forgot one last thing. And we're relaunching an engagement survey. So. Last year we did, or sorry, six months ago, we had a snapshot engagement survey. It told us a lot about the organization at a specific point in time. We're going to be re, um, rerunning an engagement survey in May, early May. The, consist, the questions are going to be consistent with six months ago, so we get both an understanding of how we have changed, hopefully improved against some of those baselines, but also what some of the issues are today that we may be facing that might be different from that period. This engagement survey will be available for full-time employees and contractors. More details on that because I know many of you will have questions, but the idea is to make it as inclusive as possible. And we're going to be using the same firm, uh, Culture Amp, for collection and presentation of results so that we have that impartial third-party consistency that we're all looking for. So that, I think, is actually the transition update. And I'm going to hand it over to Metrics. Thank you. we go. Is that good? Awesome. So I am Neil Quinn from the editing department and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the visual editor. So a lot of you probably remember the visual editor experiment that Aaron Halfaker did about a year ago. And it did not involve anything to do with Erlenmeyer flasks. What we did do was we took, um, we took new users on the English Wikipedia, gave half of them visual editor, and saw how that affected their editing, their editing behavior. Unfortunately, the study was kind of anticlimactic in the sense that we didn't find any significant difference between the two editors when it came to productivity or anything like that. But there were a couple of intriguing effects that we wanted to explore further. So on the theory that in statistics, bigger is better, we decided to do an expanded analysis uh, of, the, of the study. And that turned out not to be particularly difficult to do. Because after we got the English Wikipedia's consensus to deploy Visual Editor to all new users, we did an incremental rollout. So first we gave it to 5% of new users, then 10%, then 25%, and so on. And because we picked the 5% and the 10% and so on randomly, we were in a sense doing a series of natural experiments. So when I, took, so when I gathered together the users from that incremental rollout and put them together with the users from Aaron's original study, that took our sample size from about 20,000 new users to about 75,000 new users. And, spoiler alert, uh, pretty much all the results stayed the same from Aaron's original, uh, Aaron's original work. 
in particular, the result that the effect that I was most interested in disappeared entirely when we looked at the expanded version of the study. But there was one particular, but there was one effect that did persist, and that had to do with reverted edits. So in his original study, Aaron found that users who got the visual editor rever were reverted less often than users with the wiki text editor, although it was a fairly small effect. That stuck around in the expanded version. So in the control group, which didn't get visual editor, uh, it's, that control group saw 16.8% of its edits to Wikipedia articles get reverted. The visual editor, in the visual editor group, that same number was about 15.2%. One way of looking at this is that if the users in the visual editor group had been reverted at the same rate as the users in the control group, they would have seen about 1,100 extra reverts during the two-month period of the study. So that's all well and good. And this is the part of the presentation where I was going to talk about, you know, we can't be, in we can't be entirely certain of this and there are caveats, but this seems like good news for editors. But unfortunately, it looks like things are more complicated than that. Literally last night, I was poking at this data, and I noticed a new wrinkle in things, which is that if you filter the data in a certain way, it looks like editors in the wiki text group made slightly more editor made slightly more edits than editors in the visual editor than editors in the visual editor group, and this might explain a part, although not all, of the effect on reverts. So if you have a group of editors that's making slightly more edits they're having slightly more opportunities to get reverted. So one possible explanation of both of these events has to do with the fact that users of the wiki text editor find it harder to figure out the formatting. So you sometimes see a user making multiple edits in a row with the wiki text editor trying to figure out the formatting by trial and error. So it could be that that leads users in the wiki that have the wiki text editor to make slightly more edits and also be reverted slightly more often but that's just a tentative explanation. So this area is definitely deserving of further study. We're already planning an, another A-B test of visual editor for anonymous users. And in that, one of the things we're going to do in that study is use Aaron's or as edit quality scores to give us a fuller measure of edit quality than just was the edit made and was it reverted. And, we can, and I'm also going to apply these, me these methods to the data set from this um, this cohort of editors in the in the study for new users. But the main takeaway, I would say, is uh, expect to hear more about this in the future. So now I'm going to hand it over to, who am I going to hand this to? To Aaron Halfaker. All right, thanks, Neil, for those results. That was uh, very, very nice to see. Um, OK, so uh, today I'm going to be talking to you folks about some productivity measures that I've uh, been taking uh, around uh, editing in Wikipedia. Um, and so specifically, we're going to dig into anonymous editor productivity and efficiency. Although I'm going to show you a lot of other productivity measures, there's some really interesting results around anonymous editors that I want you to see. OK. So uh, take an article in Wikipedia, such as this one from uh, Omed Kakobi, who, by the way, is currently in jail in Iran for refusing to take part in their nuclear program. Um, so, and let's take an edit to this particular article. So in this edit, this uh, anonymous user, this IP user, uh, adds a paragraph uh, with a reference here. And uh, we would like to uh, analyze this paragraph and find out how, how productive of a contribution was this to the article. Now, we can look at this with our, our eyeballs and, and read it and make judgments about it, but that doesn't really work at scale. I want to take measurements for the entire encyclopedia, so I need, to, I need a good way to compute how, how, per, how high of quality this contribution actually was. And so there's this metric that I've been working on for a while and that I've published about quite a bit that I like to refer to as content persistence. And so this, uh, this little graphic that I have for you essentially uh, shows uh, a toy example of what content persistence looks like. So we're looking at five revisions to an article about apples. Um, and we can see that some of the content persists between the revisions, but some of the content doesn't. 
Um, and so uh, we use a few a few ways to get around some weird editing behaviors. So for example, we detect reverts and we reapply uh, 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 ownership of the words beyond those reverted edits. But otherwise, we're really just doing diffs between the revisions of the article and tracking authorship of content as we move forward in time. Uh, for those of you who use a lot of version control, essentially we're doing git blame. OK. So uh, using this content persistence measurement, I want to define a term. And this is a metric of productivity that I use that I have uh, uh, determined by doing some sensitivity analyses, by finding good thresholds. So a persisting word is a word-like token that an editor added to an article that survives at least five revisions by other people or 48 hours before being removed for forever. And so these plots that I have on the bottom of the screen are essentially showing you that if a token lasts five revisions or 48 hours, it's probably going to last forever. No one's ever going to come in and remove it. So essentially what we're doing is taking advantage of Wikipedians' curation practices of cleaning up the article to find out which contributions were the best, uh, which contributions stuck the most. So this isn't a complete measurement of productivity. There's a lot of productive work in Wikipedia that doesn't involve adding content to articles, such as discussing the article content on the talk page, working on templates, uploading images, doing counter vandalism work, the very curation that allows us to take this measure, and of course doing research and tool development. These are all productive things for Wikipedia, and this measurement doesn't account for them. But it's pretty good. It recognizes, recognizes additions of good new content to articles in Wikipedia. OK, let's look at what this measurement actually shows us. So this is a account of the number of new persisting words added to Wikipedia month by month over time. And so we can see a very familiar shape here. There's this sort of exponential growth period that happens between 2004 and 2007. The growth period ends. But we can see kind of a high level of stability here. Um, and that's something that might be surprising for people who are familiar with this other graph the count of the number of active editors who are working on Wikipedia month to month. In that graph, we see a substantial decline that starts in 2007. Now, I, I do like uh, considering our community size in the number of active editors, but there's actually another measure that I've actually published about quite a bit, too, that I think is a little bit more useful for thinking about this stuff. Um, and that's, oh yeah, so I just wanted to show that the, the slopes are different, and then I'll move on to this other measure. OK, so, uh, and that's labor hours. So I've been developing measurements where we can get a pretty good estimate of the amount of time that people are spending working on Wikipedia. Um, you know, a shortcut if you want to go read this research, it's about 100 million hours by 2012 have been spent writing Wikipedia. Um, but the cool thing about this measure is it lets us build these month-to-month -month estimates of the amount of time that people are putting into writing Wikipedia. OK, so this graph is actually old. I've actually taken new measurements. I didn't have time to make you a new graph, so I just drew you where those measurements end up. Um, and that's what this dashed line that we're looking at here. OK, so if we compare the number of labor hours that editors put into Wikipedia, and so this is raw time and attention of Wikipedia editors, to output, which are, are these uh, words that persist when they're added to articles, these, these productive contributions, we can see some really different slopes here. Um, and really, if I, if I back of the envelope this, if I just get a, a general estimate of, of what sort of thing is happening here, essentially in 2006, during the, the spike of Wikipedia, we were getting about 258 persisting word-like tokens added to Wikipedia per hour, per hour invested by an editor. And now we're getting about 414 persisting words uh, added per labor hour to Wikipedia. Um, which suggests that somehow Wikipedia is getting a lot more efficient. For the same amount of time invested by people, we can get more good content, which is kind of surprising. So where's this efficiency coming from? I, I had a hypothesis going into this that maybe, maybe it's bots and tool-assisted editing. There are a lot more tools available for editing Wikipedia now than there were before. Um, so I broke out this graph by the type of editor and way of editing that they're doing. So this, this top line, the one that goes really high here, is uh, the, the uh, persisting word tokens added by registered editors who are using the standard editing interface. So this is the normal wiki text editor or the visual editor. 
And here, we don't really see a decline. I thought that maybe there was a rise in tool use and there would be a decline of manual editing, and so we would actually see the decline here. Um, but we don't. That's kind of surprising. Oh, sorry, I've got my dog. OK, so let's see. Oh, sorry, I've lost my focus. There we go. So yeah, no real decline here. Um, However, when we look at the edits that are the productivity of anonymous editors using the standard editing interface, we do see a declining turn here, and this roughly uh, uh, matches the shape of labor hours invested into Wikipedia. Um, so there's definitely a decline happening there, a decline in the productivity of anonymous editors. Um, and down at the bottom, we can see the two uh, automated, uh, so this is uh, tool assisted is in the blue, and bot is on the very bottom here. And that's kind of hard to see from where we are here. So let's zoom in onto this bottom part so we can talk about those. OK, now we're looking at the overall proportion of productive words added to Wikipedia. And so on the, the y-axis there, we're actually looking at a proportion now. And so we can see that anons are definitely declining. They're producing a smaller and smaller proportion of the overall productivity to English Wikipedia. Um, but it's really interesting to note that back in 2006, they were adding about 20% of the productive new article content, and now they're adding 15% of the productive article content. This is more than I expected. This is a really large amount. 15% of the overall productivity is added by users who are not logged in. OK, looking at the bots next. And bots are, bots are very interesting to look at on this graph because bots tend to, to add content to Wikipedia in bursts. And so we see this really spiky behavior happening here. Um, we also can see kind of a drop off around 2012. And so I kind of wonder if maybe, maybe this was the introduction of Wikidata and people were aiming their bots more towards adding content to Wikidata rather than writing content in Wikipedia. I'm not sure. That's an open question. Um, but we can definitely see a rise in the, uh, the tools that people use, the non-bot tools that people use to edit Wikipedia, not through the standard editing interface, but through some, some automated strategy. And so I wanted to show you what tools are most prolific for adding productive new content to Wikipedia. So these are the five most prolific tools for adding that, those persisting tokens to Wikipedia. Um, so the, the most prolific one is called AutoWiki Browser. That's what AWB stands for. Uh, AutoWiki Browser is a semi-automated system. It's, it's sort of like running a bot. You can use categories and various ways to select a set of articles and then apply an operation to that set of articles in batch. So essentially, it's like a very simple way to program a bot to do a limited set of things to a large set of Wikipedia articles. Um, so the next class of automated tools I want to talk to you about are uh, formerly reflinks and now called refill. There's a fun story about why that switched, but I don't have time to tell it here. Essentially, they're doing the same thing. So these tools will take a bare reference. And if you can sort of see my cursor here, I'm not actually sure if it's showing up on the screen, but I'm showing the, the uh, ref tags that are in the upper right of this refill interface. It will turn a ref tag that just contains a URL and change it to a ref tag that has a nice citation template with some information that can be extracted from the URL, such as the page title and publisher information, maybe even the access date. Um, and so these tools are used quite a bit to add productive new content to Wikipedia. So the last tools that I want to talk to you about are AutoEd and a, a tool that shows up called OConfucius. But it actually turns out that OConfucius is a user that writes a lot of scripts that work within AutoEd. AutoEd is a lot like AutoWiki Browser, but AutoWiki Browser is a standalone application, whereas AutoEd is a set of JavaScript gadgets that uh, run inside your browser on Wikipedia. And so they're sort of filling that same sort of uh, niche as uh, AutoWiki Browser. It's really important, though, that this sort of thing shows up. I bet you that the, the people who are working on AutoEd and user OConfucius don't know how productive their tools actually are. They're so productive that they show up right at the top in the top five anyway. OK, I just want to summarize what I told you in this set of stats here. So it looks like English Wikipedia's efficiency, uh, the amount of time spent editing Wikipedia versus the amount of productive words that are added to articles, is up 87%. And I'm not quite sure why. It's something that's probably worth looking into. Um, we can see that there isn't really a decline in the places that we thought there might be, such as uh, registered editors who are editing the wiki manually. Um, 
But there's definitely a decline in anonymous editors' overall productivity in Wikipedia. Still, we should really consider anonymous editors carefully when we're designing products, when we're considering policies that we're going to set up in the wiki, because they are very productive. They contribute a lot of the productive content to the wiki. Um, and of course, tool use is on the rise. Um, and it's mostly force multiplier is you click a button once and a lot of edits happen, or tools that do reference cleanup for you. And that's it. Thank you very much, folks. Sorry, one moment. We're uh, um, right. So I guess you're up. Right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Danny Horn, product manager for the community tech team. Uh, one of the things that's cool about working in community tech is that we get to work with some of the volunteer developers who are working on our project. Our backlog comes from the community wishlist survey, which we ran at the end of last year. And uh, our team is responsible for addressing the top 10 wishes from that list. Now, it turns out that when you ask our community what are the things that they really, really want, uh, there's probably somebody who's already working on it, because that is what wiki people are like. And uh, we get to have sort of the, the fun experience of working with those volunteer developers, helping to support their project and expand it so that um, they can get it deployed and actually out on the wiki. Uh, wish number seven on the list, uh, the PageView Stats tool. The volunteer who was working on that is Leon Zimba, who's known on the wiki as Music Animal. Uh, he was working with the analytics team's uh, new PageView Stats demo. I'm sorry, the PageView Stats API, uh, and turned it into a really cool tool that's now deployed on all of our wikis. Uh, I've got Leon on the phone right now, along with Ryan Caldari, who's uh, the community tech manager. And ladies and gentlemen, I present to you, Ryan, <laughs> Leon and Ryan. Gentlemen, take it away. Hello, thank you. Um, I guess I'm going to go ahead and talk uh, and hand it over to Ryan whenever he wants. Um, first off, I want to thank uh, Marcel from the analytics team. He created the original uh, demo for that uses the API. And I branched off of that, so this probably would have never happened if it hadn't been for him. And also to Ryan and Community Tech for their enormous help. Uh, without further ado, let me show you what I've been working on. I'm going to turn on the screen share. All right, can, can everybody see that? Are we good? Yep. Okay, awesome. So here we are. This is uh, what I call page views analysis. Um, this is the sample when you first go to the page. Uh, it has data for the articles cat and dog on the English Wikipedia. And you have several options here. The date range. Uh, you can pick uh, the latest 10, 20, 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, this is familiar with people who use the old uh, stats that grok.se uh, tool, which is um, what they've been using for page views statistics for many years. Um, and then under here, you can also pick things like last week, this month, last month, uh, and then some arbitrary range. Uh, and then also the platform, desktop, mobile app, mobile web, the user agent, uh, which we always go by user rather than a search engine or bot, because that's what we're most interested in is our actual readers. Um, and then it uh, plots it out here for you. Uh, you've got the totals and the average per day. And I'll go ahead and add a few more. Uh, do a giraffe, a sea lion, because that's my favorite animal. Uh, maybe a bear. So, and you can go all the way up to 10 different articles at the same time. Uh, have different chart types, bar. It doesn't re really work very well when you have a lot of articles. Uh, then radar. This one I don't really find particularly useful, but it's still pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> then there's pi. We all know what the pi is. 
and then donut, which is basically the same except it has a hole in the middle. Uh, then polar area, where the uh, radius of each is equal, but the um, the length of it represents how many page views you get. And you can also download the data as CSV or JSON. A uh, couple other settings. Uh, we tried our best to do um, internationalization. Uh, and so there we have uh, the date formats here, which you see are um, what we use in uh, the United States with the month, the day, and then the year, which you can turn off uh, and then use the standard format of year, month, day. Same thing with the numerical data. Sometimes uh, they like to copy and paste the totals, so it's good to have the uh, commas out. And uh, we tried real hard, worked with um, Translate Wiki and Intuition to get um, some translations, and that's been going pretty well. Uh, we have a lot of languages here that are covered, 65% uh, it looks like overall. Uh, so that's been excellent. And I'm going to try to go back here. Okay, so that is page views analysis. Um, I also got lots of feedback from the community, uh, which spawned two other efforts, uh, one of which is what I call top views. And this shows you the top views article, uh, the top viewed articles, pardon me, and on a given wiki um, and given platform. Uh, also, you can pick whichever date range you want. So here we're looking at the English Wikipedia for last week. Um, and right away you can see main page obviously is at the top. And you can get all these out and then some false positives like this one. Uh, and then get a nice picture of uh, the most popular articles for that time period. And this goes all the way down to a thousand. So, and at some point I want to add a search too. So, say you've just been working on a popular article and you want to find out what number it is for last week, you'll be able to do that, assuming it's when, within the top 1,000. Um, and then here, these numbers, uh, you can click on them and they will bring you back to page views analysis for that article in the given date range. You see, Prince uh, had quite a spike there, obviously. Um, I have a new version of this tool coming out soon that will use a logarithmic chart uh, so you can actually see this data down here better. So these are very high numbers but they look like they're close to zero. Uh, so I hope to get a better solution for that soon. Um, so that covers top views and then finally there's one more uh, which I dub lang views. Uh, which just shows uh, a given article and uh, its page view statistics across all the language of sister projects. So um, this would be, you know, Wikipedia, Wictionary, et cetera, as, opp as opposed to like MediaWiki because there are no multilinguals for that. So um, for this, I'm going to uh, use Barack Obama as an example only because I know there are um, pages on it on lots of languages and also some of them are featured or good articles. So I'll go ahead and submit that. Currently I'm working with the analytics team to make sure I don't overload the API because this is a there's a lot of processing going on here where I think there's 200 plus wikis that it's querying. So it's a little bit slow right now but worth the wait and here we are. So here's Barack Obama for last week across all languages. And so that's 209 languages. Uh, here you can see there are five good articles. One, uh, this is called a recommended article, uh, which is DA. I'm not sure which language that is. And then seven featured um, your total page views across all the languages and the averages. And you can sort. So to see where you know um, the better written articles on the subject are I suppose um, and so that I guess is Langviews um, and then finally I wanted to talk very quickly about the usage uh, this original tool that 
the page views analysis, um, was released February 10th of this year. And so I, I have some anonymous data collected. All it does is simply collect uh, the page loads themselves and then records uh, which project they're querying for. And this is only page loads, not uh, individual queries. So if I go here and I do this, these aren't counted. It's only the initial page load. So up at the top we have the German Wikipedia at uh, just over 208,000. Um, and that's because they actually have a link to it at the very bottom of every article. Um, which is, this is where you typically put the copyright information. Um, other wikis, uh, the most popular place to put the link is under the revision history. So here we have page view statistics, um, but it's also on many wikis under page information, which takes a little while to load. But and then down here, page views. So uh, going through, it looks like now we are up to 100 and 165 different uh, Wikimedia Foundation wikis uh, with a total of just over 600,000. Um, 600, uh, and then I, I used to collect data in a different way, which was just simply uh, the loads themselves and not on a per project basis. So I have that data here as well. And then if you tag on top views and lang views, which are not currently advertised, which is why their usage is low. Uh, we have uh, are getting close to a million since the 9th of February, uh, around uh, 12,000 per day, uh, eight per minute, and that's roughly every seven seconds, which I would think is a bit more often now that the uh, tool has become more popular, um, but we'll see as time goes on. And that's basically it. Did uh, Ryan, did you have anything to add? No, I, no, I, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, thank you for your time. Great. Thank you, everyone. And now it is uh, time for Q&A. So if anybody has any questions about pie or donuts or Anything else? I guess we'll go first to IRC. So James, do we have any questions? Hi there. Uh, Aaron, I've got a question for you from Matt Fashion. Uh, when you're looking at tools that produce uh, words added, do you look at hashtag edit summaries, uh, which is used by Prove It and Refill? And do we have Aaron? Also a good question. <laughs> There we go. Sorry, I was hard hardware muted. Um, so we, we don't use uh, hashtags, uh, which is regretful because hashtags are uh, a much better way to do what we did. Instead, uh, there's a, a list of regular expressions that I can uh, look for a link for and drop that into chat later uh, that have been maintained in there on a wiki page. And so uh, I've been working on them with a few other people. Uh, um, they match uh, comment structures that these tools will use. Um, and so we've we've developed them to, to work historically. And so even when, if we were to use hashtags now, we'd probably actually have to use both hashtags for the recent stuff and the regular expressions for the old stuff. Uh, I hope we can move to hashtags as fast as possible because that's so much easier. Great. Um, by the way, the, the microphone is over there for anybody in, in um, San Francisco who wants to ask a question. But James, any more questions from IRC? No questions. Really? <laughs> oh, now I see somebody getting up. Okay. I'm. Hey. Um. So, my key takeaway was that tools are incredibly efficient, and uh, VE hasn't had much, like, impact. Uh, then why don't we spend more time making tools within the foundation? Like, why don't we fund that effort? Like, I'm just like, you know, throwing that. Uh, <laughs> as a, <laughs> just, just like a, like you know, I just wanted to like you know figure out like what the, what the, <laughs> yeah. All right. 
Um, is there anybody who wants to take that? I can I can speak to like I believe that um, one of the things that we should do is a lot uh, is is have um, a like we have a community out there that is doing amazing things with things like tool labs with all of the infrastructure that's provided, and I think that um, is also a a fantastic thing for us to focus on, but yes, Trevor. It's okay. <laughs> um, I just want to like put this out there that um, even very early on, if anyone saw my presentations at Wikimania in DC, um, which is like 2011 or something, I mean, really early on, we always knew that Visual Editor was bringing down one of a sequence of barriers. And the other barriers still remain. We haven't touched them. And a, a big criticism at the time that we had as a team is we're like, well, we're working on the editor, but who else is working on all the other issues? Uh, and now I am, and I take responsibility for that. Um, and I think that a huge part of that focus is what you see now with the collaboration team. Uh, if you look at the annual plan, what we're looking at is looking at all of these other antiquated processes and tools, onboarding, how can we how can we do things that we're uniquely positioned to do that uh, work in concert with things like Tea House that have been really effective. Uh, but a lot of times these other barriers are things that we're not very uniquely positioned to do. So it's not always easy for us to just jump in and build big tech solutions. So we agree that like this didn't solve it. We also sort of predicted this wouldn't solve it, so that that's okay. And I just want to add, we're we're funding labs pretty heavily in that fiscal across a bunch of departments. Um, we're funding community tech, and uh, you know, setting up that team to be more responsive to community requests, and obviously to partner with the community more, maybe maybe even expand the scope a little bit. So, uh, you know, it takes a bu takes a bunch of different things to to solve this problem. It's a complex problem. Thanks for. The Last question of your WM career. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wanted to jump in and, and address this too because I you know like I, I worked on uh, the study. I've been talking to to Neil about his recent work and and reporting on these these productivity measures. Um, like I would say that uh, a lot of the the tools like these these more productive tools that I was showing you are these tools that are used to do productive work are are highly specialized. Um, and most of the work still gets done by people going through the standard editing interface. I think we're always we're always uh, uh, negotiating a balance of of tools that can do like a specialized job really quickly and efficiently, and then tools that will generally let you do what you think is right in the certain context. And so we need both of these. Um, you know, I think that it's really important that we we uh, you know have resources for labs, that we have a community tech team that can help support these specialized tools, and we also have really really good basic editing technology. Um, and I, I, there's nothing in my work that suggests that uh, we don't need both. Yes, Joe. I'll just follow. This is Joe Patazzoni. I'll just follow up on that question about uh, the. The figure that Neil presented really was about one particular measure that had to do with persistence, if I understand, um, of the edits. There, as somebody who uses Visual Editor, I find it impossible to believe that there are not differences that can be measured. Um, for example, I, we must have looked at, is there any difference in the uh, number of edits, for example, that the Visual Editor editors make the edits who are the same? Uh, cohort of being new editors, et cetera. I mean, and I know, I think I think a lot of people, me included, have the same experience of seeing that and saying, wow, this is very much at odds with the qualitative experience that new users have of Visual Editor. I know I've shown Visual Editor to my roommates, and I think I was telling them about this presentation last night, and when I told my roommate, oh yeah, and the study found no difference in number of edits between Visual Editor and Wikitext, she went, <gasps> And she was she was visibly shocked, and I think a lot of us share the same thing. But we have looked at number of edits, and we haven't found a difference. So I think we're continuing to look. But I mean, I think that is something we have to, you know, try to understand why this difference doesn't exist. And I think the notion of sequential barriers is part of it. I think the notion of productivity, like 
edits, raw edits is not the best measure of productivity is another thing. So maybe like using ORES scores, which actually like say how, you know, what's the probability this edit is damaging or made in good faith, maybe that will help us see the difference. But I mean, yeah, I think that is an open question of why do we have such this, such a contrast between, you know, positive qualitative experience and the lack of quantitative results. Yes, uh, no more, um, any more questions? All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, wonderful presentations and uh, great talking to everybody.